Uh, welcome to the, um, can everyone hear me in the back or do you want me to use the, yes? Uh, welcome to the last meeting of the, and who, for the taping, do you want me to speak into the microphone? Is that, yes, okay. I haven't done this before at this seminar. Um, welcome everyone to the last meeting of the semester for the Vanderbilt History uh, Seminar. And today we are consider reconsidering a classic, um, E.P. Thompson's The Making of the English Working Class, published almost 50 years ago in uh, 1963. This is the first session of its kind for the Vanderbilt History Seminar. It arose out of discussions of the Vanderbilt History Seminar Steering Committee last year, the feeling that we wanted to mix up our format a little bit. Uh, and rather than just uh, consider unpublished work ongoing by scholars, um, we thought, uh, let's bring some old scholarship back that's fallen out of discussion, fallen out of view. Uh, and uh, immediately we settled on this work, um, an extraordinarily important work uh, in working class history and history more generally in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, this session has uh, been co-sponsored by the Max Kade Center for European and German Studies. Many thanks to that center and to its director, Helmut. Where are you? There you are. <laughs> Uh, for your support and for uh, helping us um, make this the kind of session that um, we want it to be. Uh, I'll explain the format to you a, a little bit later. Um, but first, uh, let me say a few words about the making of the English working class. This book did more to stimulate and shape the study of working people than almost any other book published during the last half century. Its subject was the response of English workers to the world's first industrial revolution in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And its specific focus was on how disparate groups of workers came to a consciousness of themselves as a class and what difference their class formation and class consciousness made to English politics and society. Though focused exclusively on England, Thompson's book influenced scholarship across Europe, the United States, Latin America and beyond. Its approach shaped approaches to the study of slaves, peasants, and other subaltern groups as much, as much as it did the study of industrial workers themselves. In my own original field, which was American uh, labor history, everyone from about 1970 to 1995 wanted to write the making of the American working class, modeled on E.P. Thompson's classic. I would say no one really succeeded on a Thompsonian scale, but that's obviously an issue that's up for debate and discussion today. Uh, during this time, if you were anywhere near the field of labor or social history, a deep engagement with Thompson's work was de rigueur. Quite a, number of quite a number of the members of our own faculty were grappling with Thompson and more broadly with the history of labor and class when they were starting out. I count on this list Jim Epstein, Richard Blackett, Dennis Dickerson, David Carlton, and myself. Michael Bess encountered Thompson through his work on European environmental history. I suspect we may have some personal stories here. I will spare you mine, other than to show you this object, a copy of E.P. Thompson's The Making of, of the English Working Class, purchased by me, the fourth book I purchased as a freshman in college in 1972. I read the whole thing in the fall semester of my freshman year. I'm not sure I understood what I had read except I read all 832 pages and highlighted in yellow 800 of those pages. <laughs> uh, in all seriousness, though, uh, the book had an extraordinary impact on me. Not, it's not too strong to say that it probably changed my intellectual life in profound ways. And I think there are many other scholars from my era uh, who have the same orientation to the, this book. But the real point of today's seminar is not nostalgia, as much as we are tempted to indulge, but hard-nosed intellectual inquiry. Our task today is to revisit this seminal work, 
and to inquire into its original significance, its influence across time and space, and its relevance or irrelevance today. To launch our discussion of this book, we are very fortunate to have with us today two of the most distinguished historians at work in the United States um, today. Professor Jeff Ely sitting to my far right, which is actually an appropriate place for him to sit given the history of his work on the far right, um, is the Carl Port Distinguished University Professor of Contemporary History at the University of Michigan. A leading historian of modern German and European history, Jeff Ely has written about the German right and far right and Nazism, the European left, and the intellectual transformations entailed in the move from social to cultural history in the 1990s and beyond. His many publications include Reshaping the German Right, Radical Nationalism and Political Change After Bismarck, published in 1980, the Peculiarities of German History, published in 1980, co-authored with David Blackburn. Forging Democracy, the History of the Left in Europe, 1850 to 2000, published in 2002. And A Crooked Line, From Cultural History to the History of Society, published in 2005. Steve Hahn, sitting to my immediate right, is the Roy F. and Jeanette P. Nichols Professor of History at the University of Pennsylvania. And he is a leading scholar of African American history, the history of the American South, and the international history of slavery and emancipation. His publications include A Nation Under Our Feet, Black Political Struggles in the Rural South from Slavery to the Great Migration, published in 2004 and awarded the Pulitzer Prize in History, the Bancroft Prize in History, and the OAH's Merrill Curdy Prize in Social History. He is also the author of uh, The Political Worlds of Slavery and Freedom, published in 2009, and The Roots of Southern Populism, Yeoman Farmers and the Transformation of the Georgia Upcountry, 1850 to 1890, published in 18, uh, 1983. <laughs> I'm thinking about the populists, 1893. Well, we've got them. We've got them. And that book, won, which was published in 1983, not 1893, was winner of the Society of American Historians Nevins Prize and the OEH's Frederick Jackson Turner Award. Our procedure today is as follows. Um, we pre-circulated a brief selection of Thompson's work um, from uh, uh, the making of English working class. And we are going to ask each of our commentators to speak to up to 20 minutes about Thompson, the selection, anything else they want to bring into this conversation. And then we will open up the conversation, we will open up the seminar for general conversation, uh, as is our custom. Uh, so um, at this point, let me uh, turn it over to our commentators. Uh, and let me say um, how honored we are that you are here with us today to uh, lead us in this reconsideration of Thompson's Thompson. Thanks very much. I'm uh, uh, delighted to be here. Um, I'm going to use my time today in the following fashion. Uh, first, I'll make some brief comments on what seem to me the main features of Thompson's making in order to mark out the basic ground for discussion. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Uh, then I'll mention some major lacunae in Thompson's own account, which intervening historiographies have enabled us to see. And I'll end with some thoughts on Thompson's treatment of class as such. And I'm going to, probably going to read the first part really quickly in order to you know, stay within my time limits. And I'll, so so I, I, it will become less hectic towards the, the, the later stage of the uh, presentation. So first thing, always historicize. Very important dictum. This book was written in a time of severe political retreat for the left in the 1950s. But when the left's tried and true bearings, those of a socialist political imaginary constructed around the industrial working class and the collective agency of a labor movement were still intact. Thompson wrote the making as an ebullient counter-narrative to the official story from inside an oppositional culture secure in the terms of its materialist understanding. 
I'm referring, of course, to the British Marxist historiography about which so much has been written by now. In common with his comrades, Eric Hobsbawm, John Saville, Victor Kiernan, George Rude, and others, Thompson was avowedly writing a much larger story. He wanted to create the foundations for an overarching narrative of working class formation whose effects were still operative in the present. He saw working people as processing their experience of exploitation over generations to produce in the end a collective consciousness of class which could then serve as the foundation of radical or revolutionary politics. And this, of course, drew its authority from a reading of the texts associated with the early Marx, and in particular his 1844 manuscripts, which were very current uh, in the 1950s. So in these terms, uh, what can we say in summary about the making? And I'm going to uh, make uh, six, six points very quickly. First, um, its grandness of scale was essential to its success. The book was an erupting historical volcano of 848 pages, in Eric Hobsbawm's words, a remarkable combination of historical retrieval, oppositional grand narrative, and moral political crusade, an inspiring resource for dissent. Driven by an ethics of commitment and a dissenting sensibility, the book was fired by a certain kind of eloquent, troublemaking, disobedient, and creative disrespect for the rules and decorums of the established historiography. This was incredibly important to its, to its verve and its success, it seems to me, this grandness of scale. Second, if Thompson drew his analysis avowedly from the Marx of the 1950s, his book was also an anti-reductionist manifesto, an anti-reductionist manifesto attacking narrowly based economic history over-deterministic Marxism, and static theories of class. For Thompson, class was dynamic, eventuating through history. A relationship and a process, a common consciousness of capitalist exploitation and state repression, graspable through culture. I'm actually going to say that again because it's meant to summarize the, the approach. Class was dynamic, eventuating through history, a relationship and a process, a common consciousness of capitalist exploitation and state repression, graspable through culture. So that's the second thing. Thirdly, the book inspired by giving access to a potential counter-narrative that was different from the story of national stability and successful consensus of gradualist progression towards a naturalized present. It advanced an eloquent counter-narrative to gradualist versions of British history as the triumphal march of parliamentary evolution, a conventional story from which popular uprisings, government coercion, and civil strife, all of the rich and turbulent histories of democratic mobilization in extra-parliamentary spheres had largely been banished. Instead of this polite and complacent success story, he sought to reground the history of democratic gains in an epic recounting of resistance against violence, inequality, and exploitation. Democratic goods, he insisted, democratic goods came only as a result of collective action, mass politics, and insurrectionary resistance against the coercive, corrupt, and narrowly based political system. Fourth, he also reclaimed certain national cultural traditions for the left. Most notably, the romantic critique of industrialism and other utopian moments of cultural criticism of the 19th century, including the ideas of William Morris, of whom Thompson had devoted an earlier enormous book. Uh, here he converged with Raymond Williams, whose culture and society had also recently appeared in 1958. Fifth, Thompson's book gave full recognition to cultural history. Most potently in its extraordinary reading of Methodism, it insisted more generally on the legitimacy of popular culture, which the dominant ideology refused to acknowledge, and which the left too had not found it easy to see. 
this is where Thompson's influence conjoined with cultural studies, which was in the process of uh, forming itself as a distinctive approach to knowledge during the 1960s. Thompson's example gave the move. Thompson's example gave the move from labor's institutional study to social histories of working people, huge momentum, rapidly encompassing, uh, rapidly encompassing the parts of life labor historians had hitherto rarely reached. Not just the workplace in all its practices and customs, but also housing, nutrition, leisure and sport, drinking, crime, religion, magic and superstition, education, song, literature, childhood, courtship, sexuality, death, and more. So it's wrong to sort of uh, to uh, assign Thompson to social history in some sort of contradistinction to the cultural history that you know comes after you know the the uh, the uh, proverbial turn in the, in the course of the 1980s and the 1990s. It seems to me that Thompson's book gave full and complete recognition to cultural history already. Uh, sixth, finally. Uh, by pioneering research on popular protest, customary culture, and the transformations brought by industrialization, Thompson opened out the understanding of politics. In that sense, the making belongs with uh, Hobsbawm's Primitive Rebels that was published in 1959, and George Rude's The Crowd in History, sometime in the early 1960s, two other key texts of that, uh, of that uh, moment. So those are the things that I would sort of pick out from the book in order to you know, kind of locate its, um, its main significance. And now I'd like to uh, flag um, some attenuations. I'm going to mention three, uh, the, the two in a bit of detail, and the third just to flag it, since I don't really have time. Um, so I'm going to flag a series of attenuations, various fronts, on which the making either left things out or disabled one's ability to recognize really important problems. So I, I think it's really important not to sort of enthrone this book in a sort of a, a, a place that's uh, immune from criticism, quite the contrary, in fact. So first, in that respect, by the time uh, the making appeared in 1963, uh, Thompson's main interests were already migrating elsewhere to the social history of property crimes, the law, and the 18th century political order, and to the transformations of customary culture beneath the onslaught of a rapidly commercializing capitalism. You see, I'm trying to slow down a bit now. The classic essays on time, work, discipline, and, and industrial capitalism and the moral economy of the English crowd in the 18th century were the first fruits of this new work, along with two others on rough music and the sale of wives, together with two books, his own Wigs and Hunters and the collective volume Albion's Fatal Tree, both published in 1975. Now, this work eventually gathered into Customs in Common, uh, published in 1993, help transform perceptions of the transition to industrial capitalism, further dismantling the older grand narrative of the Industrial Revolution. But the shift in Thompson's interests had, co had complicated indirect effects. Though claiming to be about the working class to core, Thompson's book, the making, that is, dealt mainly with artisans. On the, other, on, uh, on the one hand, he closed his accounts in the early 1830s, just as industrialization in the fuller sense was getting underway. On the other hand, the complicated relations between the artisans and the unskilled and semi-skilled categories of workers during the pre-1832 decades went largely unaddressed in the book. Moreover, what the next generation of social historians took away from Thompson was a powerful belief that the dynamism in early labor movements came from the radicalizing of artisans rather than the recruitment of industrial factory workers uh, in mass terms. <coughs> During the 1970s, an entire corpus of pioneering social history was produced under the sign of this idea. 
for which Bill Sewell's work on Marseille and Joan Scott's on Carmo and their equivalents in US and other national historiographies uh, became emblematic. The primary analytics of this work were what I call culturalist, okay, were culturalist in the following way. The mainsprings of the working class solidarity that enabled collective action were deemed to come from a common culture shaped partly by the workplace and the acquisition of skill, partly by the bases of working class residential community, partly by ideals of respectability grounded in associations and family, and so forth. When social historians gradually began uh, dealing with working class conservatism and the failings or absence, or absence of class consciousness, it was to the breaking apart of those earlier cultures of solidarity that they also repaired, with an emphasis on consumerism, commercial entertainments, and new cultures of consumption. So actually, Thompson's The Making of the English Working Class had these sort of rather complicated indirect effects in moving attention away from the working class as it was classically understood as an industrial proletariat, which left, you know, which, which has sort of prioritized artisans and cultures of solidarity associated with that kind of skilled uh, uh, respectability and left you know, the kind of the sort of the industrial working class to a great extent unexamined uh, un, uh, for quite a long time. So that's the first attenuation that I had mentioned. Um, you know, it's not really a criticism of Thompson so much as uh, an observation about the sorts of work that it enabled and the sorts of work that it was less enabling about. So secondly, the second attenuation concerns um, women and the treatment of gender, which by the 1980s had become the object of far-reaching and frequent critique. Um, but the time-bound partialness of Thompson's account in these regards was not just about the absence of women or his masculinist conception of class. And here I'm following an argument made by Carolyn Steedman, by the way. The more serious omission concerned the constitutive importance of a specifically feminized story of sensibility, sexual relationships, and suffering for the social relations and political theory of the very process of class formation that Thompson wanted to describe. This is precisely the story, archetypal, scripted, diffused into a sensibility, discursively elaborated as ideology, that the collective agency imagined for the working man as citizen fundamentally presupposed. And here Steedman draws not only on her own arguments about the history of subjectivity with its growing 18th century associations of cultivated interiority, but also on a broader historiography concerned with the power of a popular melodramatic vision and its empathy for the suffering self. As Thompson wanted to tell the story of the making, quote, men come to new political subjectivities in community and collectivity through understanding the meaning of the suffering and exploitation they have experienced. His telling took an avowedly heroic form that was intended to inspire and, of course, did. Yet how do we deal with those workers, men as well as women, who would never have found themselves in his version of the story or with those parts of life it omitted to describe. For while the making is indeed an epic tale, it's also one which most experience of the men who act as its heroes cannot actually have fitted, or cannot actually have fitted all of the time. At the heart of Thompson's account, there remains a startling lacuna. For in this period, the structures of feeling that Thompson delineates the melodramatic mechanism by which social and self-knowledge promotes political revelation was bound up with the feminine and was almost exclusively figured by a woman and her story. And at some level, Thompson knew this, yet within the coordinates of his own time, the 1950s and the 1960s, the materialist sensibility, that is, the registers of significance and recognition, the learned idioms of politics, the available languages of social history, he wasn't able to tell it. And I think that's also something we come to understand. 
in the intervening uh, half century. Now, the third attenuation of the book came from its Englishness, which created a deafening silence around both the multinational character of the British state and its imperial presence in the wider world. And the treatment of, of the Irish mitigates against this to some extent in the book, but in, in light of the impact of post-colonial studies and the histories of empire during the past two decades, the making clearly remains seriously deficient. Now, I wanted to conclude with some thoughts on class, and I'm wondering if I have time to do that. Uh, a few minutes. How, many, how much do you need? Well, we'll see how far we, how far we get. <laughs> So I want to return to the subject of class and, and this larger theme of rich and poor. So um, if Thompson's purposes were avowedly anti-reductionist and anti-economistic, and if he formally rejected base and superstructure models of causation, he nevertheless thought inside a field of sovereign determinations, which he conceived as social, whose effects eventuated through experience. If, outcome, if outcomes could be explained on the basis of rationally retrieved and reconstructed real experiences, then the primary ground for grasping the dynamics of working class formation and the growth of class consciousness became the experience of shared exploitation, which for Thompson was itself always structured by political relations of domination emanating from the state and a variety of other local and superlocal influences. If consciousness of class sorry, if consciousness of, of belonging to a class was grounded in the interpreting of collective experience, moreover, for Thompson, this meant that class formation could only be grasped in action as a process. Now, like Marx, Thompson approached this project by thinking about continuity. He saw the formation of class collective agency as a long struggle against, against patterns of exploitation inherent to industrial capitalist production whose effects accumulated through history. Um, this made it possible confidently to connect the struggles of a past working class with present day exigencies whose logics of persistence were taken to be given by the capitalist conditions of production. So the genealogies of class inherent in Thompson's method rendered continuity as an, um, as an unproblematic unproblem concept. Now, that earlier thinking about continuity as a narrative of class experience invoked agency in two distinct ways. First, by deriving the possibilities of, of, uh, for popular agency in the past from an argument about the collective dynamics of working class self-making. And second, by claiming that the process of recuperating historical experiences of that kind could serve to create radical political agency for the presence. And so that leaves us with the following question. What power does class have to produce agency in the present? And how might this depend on historical understandings of class as well as on the continuities carrying these forward to a later time? That is, with class reconfigured in terms of the social relations of the inequality of the present, how far can we imagine a practice of social history which might contribute to our understanding of the formation of agency in the contemporary world? How might solidarities eventuate in politics over time? How does political agency attain something more than a capacity for occasional disruptions, for intermittent or sporadic effects in politics, something more than uh, isolated or punctual explosions of presence? How does it eventuate in political continuities with an efficacy for change? And last but not least, um, how might that agency reconnect with an aspiration to change, not just uh, for this or that piece of legislation or the recognition under law of previously disregarded identities, uh, profoundly important though these remain, but also uh, change affecting the state, the practices of government, and even the system of private ownership <coughs> in the economy. Okay, so those are my questions, and I have two paragraphs which started to suggest an answer, but I think I'm out of time. You're out of time, and, yeah. and use it, uh, use your, those paragraphs, bring them into our conversation. We can have them both if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a few minutes. 
Let's bring it in in the I, fo I follow instructions. I'm okay. a, a good Bolshevik. Uh, bring the, uh, <laughs> the microphone over here. Thank you very much. Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Uh, well, first of all, let me thank uh, Gary Gerstel and other members of the department for inviting me here uh, to do this. Uh, it's uh, really interesting and exciting and I hope useful um, uh, a pos a, um, possibility. Um, let me um, try to uh, talk a little bit about um, the book in terms of what it tries to do, the way in which I think it influenced uh, a generation of historians and also some questions I had that, that resonate, in fact, with uh, some of what Jeff has had to say. Um, toward the end of his famed preface to the uh, making of the English working class, uh, E.P. Thompson reflects on the value of what he calls rescuing the main actors of his story from uh, the, this very famed, uh, from the enormous condescension uh, of posterity, even those, he says, who have, may have been backward-looking, utopian, and foolhardy. After all, he writes, can you hear, uh, I don't know if I'm in a good spot here. Um, after all, he writes, okay. Uh, after all, he writes, can you hear me now? No, oh, okay. Um, we are not at the end of social evolution ourselves, and in the lost causes of the people of the Industrial Revolution, we may discover insights into social evils which uh, have yet, uh, we have yet to cure. Now, these were the early 1960s, and although Thompson had left the Communist Party in 1956, uh, it was, I think, a time of some optimism for democratic socialists like himself. He was active in the European nuclear disarmament uh, campaign. He had helped to found the New Reasoner, later the New Left Review. He had taught uh, working class adult education, and he could look out upon the rumblings of the New Left in Britain, the United States, and the continent. He could look out upon anti-colonial uprisings across the globe, and he could look out upon new forms of class and race consciousness. The greater part of the world, um, he remarked, is still uh, undergoing problems of industrialization and of the formation of democratic institutions analogous in many ways to our own experience during the Industrial Revolution and causes which were lost in England might in Asia or Africa yet be won. Now, Thompson's reflections captured my attention when I read the book for the umpteenth time some weeks ago in preparation for teaching it in my graduate seminar on slavery, labor, and empire, and I wondered how it would resonate with the intellectual lives and concerns of the students. After all, for the most part, the past two decades, uh, for most of the past two decades, the global political landscape appears to have been flattened by the Cold War by the seeming irrelevance of socialism and its problematic, and by capitalist triumphalism, especially in the spheres of culture and political discourse. Indeed, for a time, all the economic collapse of 2008 brought forth was anger and mobilization on the far right among those committing to, uh, committed to loosening whatever restraints on capitalism still remained. Then, of course, came Occupy Wall Street and counterparts elsewhere, building as it has not only on disillusionment with corporate greed, political corruption, and inequalities of wealth in the United States, but also on examples of protest and activism that have spread across Europe and the Middle East during the past year. The sense of power and possibility, the creative use of technology and communication, and the rejection of conventional political forms and hierarchies to be seen in Cairo and Tunis, Madrid and London, New York, Oakland, and Philadelphia, among many other places, may herald the emergence of new uh, and potentially transformative civic and political spaces. To these may be added left of center governments that have won popular mandates, embraced social democratic policies, and have thrived economically in much of South America, Brazil, Argentina, Ecuador, and Bolivia um, in particular, all of which suggests that for the first time in years it may be possible 
for political dissidents to gain a real hearing for ideas that push against or simply refuse the logic of capitalism. And there may be room now for political movements organized around alternative visions. And here, as Thompson imagined in the preface, historical notions of exploitation, of moral economy, and of class once pushed to the margins would seem to have renewed meaning. Thus, the deep humanity, the literary elegance, the creative research and representation, the fierce polemics, and yes, the intense partisanship of the making had a freshness this time around for myself and the graduate students that I feared had been steadily lost. Instead of trying to recover uh, a moment in time, in historical and political time, in which democratic ideas or the standard of living debate or the cultural critique of industrial capitalism or the relation between struggle and consciousness, instead of trying to summon some time when these actually assumed importance for writers and readers, the present seemed entirely opposite. Indeed, watching protesters, many of them young and unemployed, reject or invert economic languages of capitalism, build their own institutions of political debate, human mics and general assemblies, and indulge utopian sensibilities, a large sign in the Philadelphia Occupy said, the commons, not capitalism. Uh, one is reminded not only of Thompson's chapter on exploitation, but also in his, uh, of his interest in the artisans and the romantics and the Luddites. Uh, the Army of Redressers uh, has always been my favorite uh, chapter in the book, and that's the uh, chapter on Luddism. Uh, and of his insistence that class making is as much a political, perhaps more, of a political um, uh, as a social process. All of this brought to mind uh, my own encounter and that of a cohort of American historians like me uh, with Thompson's work at a time when the possibilities for change were very much in the air. There was nothing quite like the making of the English working class in the American historical literature when we were finding our way through it, and there was no one writing American history like Edward Thompson. His work showed a deep political commitment, a profound grasp of theory, a sharp polemical style, and a remarkably original approach to the questions of class and class consciousness. At the same time, it was immensely erudite, scholarly, and literary. It didn't simply rescue uh, obscure laboring folk from the condescensions of posterity. It placed them as important actors in a grand epic in which the theory, instead of accompanying, encumbering, or explicitly directing the narrative, seemed to emerge from its very telling which is to say that the work was simultaneously irreverent and reverent. History imagined as only a political partisan could, and yet presented as a trained and renowned scholar would. There was much of great value offered in uh, Thompson's work, the making in particular, although Jeff has pointed to his work on the 18th century as well, to American historians who were themselves seeking to uncover the experiences and aspirations of ordinary folk and their contributions to the nation's history. There was Thompson's argument about the artisan foundations of democracy, his notions of moral economy, custom, and rough justice as alternatives to and defenses against the market and the state, his complex treatment of working class involvement with evangelical Christianity, Methodism in particular, and his suggestions about the way in which laboring men and women, excluded from the official arenas of politics, engaged in political struggle in their own right. Equally important, there was Thompson's detective work, his love of the documents and the archives, the clues he offered about recuperating apparently lost episodes and perspectives, and his ability to read against the grain. The making of the English working class is, I think, a vast canvas of historical analysis and artistry but it is also a rather remarkable seminar in historical method, and it's very self-consciously so. But Thompson also offered something less tangible and no less significant for us. He offered a special sort of voice and presence, a voice and presence that was forceful, confident, and self-assured. For young American scholars of the left 
who at that point did really not, did, I mean, it's hard to imagine this since we're all being vilified as, you know, being raving uh, left-wing lunatics on uh, college campuses. But it's hard to remember that, you know, at this particular point, um, young uh, scholars of the left did not have much of a niche already carved out for themselves and whose work was usually dismissed, disparaged, and disregarded by the professional establishment. And therefore, Thompson's voice was enormously powerful and energizing, all the more so because Thompson did not wear the adornments of academic respectability, because he had neither a doctorate nor uh, a prestigious university post, but had rather come to history chiefly as a political activist and tutor in adult education. As the story he tells is that the, he signed up to do the making of the English working class because he needed the money. He was going to do a big history of uh, uh, British workers, and this was the first chapter. Uh, uh, here um, uh, was the outsider, the renegade outsider, taking on the insiders. And it seemed, at least to us, besting them at their own game by bringing learning and language and political imagination to bear. To this day, <coughs> I have the making and much of the rest of Thompson's work near my desk to retrieve when I need a dose of intellectual and creative energy. And opening the book, <coughs> And reading a few pages almost never fails to remind me of why I wanted to write history, of what I think history has to offer us, and of how past and present can resonate with one another. <clears throat> but when I sit down with the whole thing every couple of years or three in preparing to teach it, I'm also reminded of the assumptions and ways that prevailed of the time of its writing and of my initial readings that now seem odd and out of place, and especially of historical literature over the years that has called into serious question much of the framework that seemed so sensible and compelling then. So I would like in my uh, last few minutes just to make uh, a few points about this, some of which Jeff made too. <coughs> Uh, one of the things that almost immediately strikes a reader these days, rather jarringly from the first page of the preface, is the deeply gendered but also unexamined construct of class that Thompson proposes. To be sure, again, Jeff mentioned this, women, of course, populate the book in some numbers and perhaps more so than one would have expected in the early 1960s, and yet class is something that happens not in human relationships, as Thompson writes at one point, but chiefly in the lives and experiences of men. The relations in which Thompson is interested are those of the workplace and the state, and the relations of community and class making are those of the taverns and corresponding societies, newspapers, pamphlets, and trade unions from which women were marginalized or excluded. He's not interested in the relations of power that linked working men to their households and families, to their wives and children, or in whether those relations had much of any bearing on the nature uh, and political sensibilities of an emerging working class. Now, this issue has, of course, been raised by numbers of scholars, I think also of Joan Scott and Catherine Hall, Barbara Taylor and Anna Clark, uh, prominent among them. And it speaks both to the usefulness of class in the Thomsonian sense of it and to what class making may involve uh, if, at the very least, gender was regarded as intrinsic or mutually constitutive. Here, some of the best, I think, and most interesting suggestions have been made by historians of the middle class who have demonstrated that the activities of women in evangelicalism and social reform and their encounters with poor women in a variety of social sites became central to developing class identities. It may well be that Thompson's hostility to Methodism prevented him from exploring or was part of a more general resistance to exploring the sites in which class-inflected ideas of gender roles, sexuality, and social responsibility were struggled over, and in which women and gender became significant parts of working class sensibilities. Uh, my next of three points. Um, more recently, uh, historians, at least on the American side, and I think Jeff has suggested it's not only on the American side, have begun to challenge the artisan-to-worker model of class and class consciousness that was so central to the story of the making of the English working class 
and that, as Gary suggested earlier on, that frame much of the labor and social history for the next quarter century. They have turned their attention from the workshops to the harbors and slop shops, canals and railroads, and thus from skilled craftsmen and journeymen to what are called common laborers who were free, in some cases in forms of servitude or enslaved, and whose shared experience was one of exploitation, underemployment, material deprivation, social isolation, transiency, political disfranchisement, and bitter rivalries of race and ethnicity. These workers on whom early industrial capitalism fed had not fallen from the ranks of artisans, but had instead been pushed off the land on both sides of the Atlantic, rendered dependent by circumstances of bonder, bondage and gender and age, turned out into the labor market by the demands and instabilities of family economies, and forced to cobble together an always precarious subsistence. Thompson writes of some of them very powerfully in his chapter on the field laborers, a very good one, which he acknowledges is the largest segment of the uh, English uh, laboring population at the time, but then seems to lose track of them or lose serious interest in them. Many did come to see themselves in an antagonistic relation with their employers and the state more quickly, perhaps, than did craftsmen. And they did find ways to register their grievances and resist their exploitation. And yet class, in the Thompsonian sense, is not something that appears to have happened to them, at least during this period. Social and political volatility was more continuously their fate. They struck. They brawled with co-workers. They quit and moved on. They aligned with urban gangs. They suffered from nativist violence. They entered the sex trade and the almshouse. And they joined filibustering missions or the army. In this way, class may not always be something that emerges almost teleologically out of instability or incoherence. It may not always be something that people make. It may also be something that encumbers people or is thrust upon them or that they inhabit owing to material conditions, to perpetual instabilities, to gender conventions, social segregation, visual regard and representation, and state policy. And he talks about this a little bit uh, in relation to textile uh, uh, workers in the book. And that eventually um, uh, these uh, experiences of class can assume significant cultural meaning as well as political manifestation. Class may indeed happen, as Thompson argues, as an identity of interest between groups of working people and as against those of other classes, along with, as he puts it, a maturing claim for an alternative system. But it may more regularly and powerfully be seen in the way people live and talk, engage in recreation, understand their prospects, seek to educate themselves, practice their faith, behave as spouses, parents, and children, and define the landscape of power and politics. In both cases, class happens in the process of struggle, but we may imagine fields of struggle that are more wide-ranging in their nature and project. What also strikes the reader of the making these days, and this will be the last point I'll make, is, and again, Jeff alluded to this, is its stunning insularity. Thompson apologizes at the outset for neglecting the histories of Scots, Welsh, and Irish workers. And he may be forgiven for this, since in his words, he did so out of, quote, respect rather than chauvinism. But in nearly 900 pages of text that elaborate in rich detail the many struggles of English working people and the repressive responses of the English state, one would hardly know that during these years, England was also an empire facing challenges stretching from South Asia to North America and the Caribbean, and that therefore class formation and state formation took place in international and colonial contexts, mediated as well by race, ethnicity, and immense spiritual diversity. Take the case of the British Caribbean. Between the 1780s and 1830s, 
when the English working class was, in Thompson's reckoning, being made. The Atlantic world was convulsing over the future of slavery in the plantation system that had been enriching Europe, uh, and England included, uh, for over three centuries. An anti-slavery movement which had been developing for decades among the enslaved now saw a counterpart emerge among reformers and religious dissenters in England, many of whom were deeply involved in commerce and early manufacturing. Gradualist in the latter instance and far more militant in the former, these movements then entered a new phase in the 1790s, Thompson's crucial decade, owing to the Caribbean version of Jacobinism, the Haitian Revolution, which gets not a mention in the making of the English working class, despite the important place of the French Revolution on the continent. Indeed, the dynamics of mobilization and repression, of shifting alliances, and of political education that figures so significantly in the making had close parallels in the slavery struggle, sometimes embodied in people like William Wilberforce, who does appear in both stories, though playing very different roles. Just as the London Corresponding Society formed part of a new uh, uh, network of dissenting groups in the face of state repression in the 1790s, so did the slave rebellion in San Domingue spread news and ideas of social transformation across the Americas despite official efforts to staunch it. Just as laboring people were swept into the evangelical waves of Methodism with varying political outcomes, so did slaves encounter evangelical missionaries, some of whom were allied with the planters and others who were allied um, with the slaves to important effect. And those of you who know something about this history know of the significance in many places, especially Jamaica, of the Baptist chapels. Just as England was engulfed in labor strife, Luddism, Peterloo, and the likes, so was the British Caribbean up, uh, erupting with slave resistance and rebellion in Barbados, Demerara, and uh, Jamaica. And the almost simultaneous enactments of slave emancipation and political reform in the early 1830s were hardly accidental or extraneous to the class-making process that Thompson, uh, in which Thompson was interested. I'll just finish here. Uh, it's worth asking, it seems to me, about class formation on the imperial and international stage, about how the making of the working and middle classes in England took shape. And I think this is something that Catherine Hall uh, uh, tries to do, took shape in relation to the colonies. Uh, to resistance and reform there, and what these relations have to say about the political dispositions of the classes themselves. And we've been learning much more about this uh, in relation, I think, to the middle class. It's also worth asking how to place the struggles of new working classes who were making themselves uh, in relation to slavery and then in relation to contested notions of freedom, which is to say, are the black workers of Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, Guyana, who remained British subjects for a long time to be considered part of the British working class in any meaningful sense? Or are they to be considered objects against whom or in relation to whom British workers defined themselves? And I think this issue is raised in an American context when you think about the relationship between emerging industrial workers in the so-called North and slaves turned free people in the so-called South. To be sure, one could put down the making of the English working class now almost a half century since its publication, convinced that class making is an elusive and perhaps deceptive phenomenon. Its presumed dynamics may seem compelling and its resistance to economic determinism, which uh, Jeff also um, uh, suggested, may be laudable, but its empirical hurdles appear so formidable and its claims so potentially teleological that one may wonder what analytical use it in the end serves. And yet for all of my growing reservations and dissents as to Thompson's way of grasping and revealing class, I have to say I always put down the book feeling that a door of exploration and understanding has been opened to me and to us, that there are places to take the ideas and analysis that Thompson himself may not have imagined that the making of the English working class retains a remarkable portability and effervescence. And as we witness a resurgent attentiveness to issues of economic inequality and exploitation here and abroad, 
And as we witness people mobilizing around the us, all 99% of us, as against the them, only 1% of them, as rich as they are, it's hard not to think about the lost causes uh, that may yet be won. And I'll finish there. Thank you very much. Thanks to both of you. I would dare say the door to understanding and exploration has been opened. And I welcome any of you to step through it. Um, I think for the purposes of filming, I'm going to ask Jason to um, bring a mic to the questioners. So it's, we're departing a little, and that will also enable everybody to hear. Uh, so if you want to speak, let me um, have your names or your hands, and um, I'll put together my list. Uh, Joel. Microphone's coming. Thank you both. I uh, mentioned to Jeff before the seminar started that my uh, first time I read this book was exactly 30 years ago as a first year graduate student at Michigan. And the professor of the class was Jeff Ely. <laughs> and uh, I didn't reread the whole book, I'm sorry to say, but I did look at the excerpt. And I looked through the book, and I was struck by a surprising realization. I, I wondered if both of the speakers would, would talk to this. It seems the book, to me, has both an iconic uh, political status function as well as a historical dimension. And it seemed to me ironic that the historical one, the one that's supposedly looking backwards, trying to recapture people, lost ways and lost ways of thinking and lost culture, is actually the most forward-looking ahead to modern cultural history and talking about agency and talking, you know, way ahead of its time, I think. The part that supposedly is looking forward about re-energizing the left really is very backward-looking to me. I mean, I think there's a really, I was struck by a, a romantic, even elegiac, elegiac tone about the, art, the world of the artisan, the, the, the artisan. And in some ways, it's as much about the unmaking of that world as it is the making of what we call the 20th century working class. So I wondered if you could comment on that, about this, the, if you agree with this idealization of that type of worker, and uh, why Thompson might have been doing that. Um, hmm, Professor Ely. I don't know what to say. <laughs> um, well, I, I was, I, it was commenting really on your point that he doesn't really address as much the working yeah, class yeah. of today. And there might be a reason for that. I think there was a, um, a um, I think it's, 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 it's mainly to do with this desire for a, counter a usable counter-narrative that's not just about class formation, but it's about class form processes of class formation embedded in very particular English histories. You know, and he often uh, remarked about, uh, you know, when his, when his interest moved back into the 18th century, how he was sort of advancing backward to join hands with Christopher Hill uh, you know, the historian of uh, the English Revolution in the 17th century. And I th so I think it, it's, 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 it's probably to be understood in terms of this overall project of that generation of British Marxist historians to rewrite the history of England, including the, uh, the, uh, the history of the Industrial Revolution, you know, because there was a lot of um, celebratory um, sort of uh, economic history being produced in the 1950s about the you know the triumphs of progress and so on and I, some of you probably remember are familiar at least with the standard of living controversy you know that uh, you know that my that certainly you know my generation of undergraduates in Britain kind of when they were doing you know their modern British stuff used to you know cut our teeth right so that, so so there's a there's 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 a pushing back against um, uh, 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 a sort of an, uh, an, an aggregate, sort of um, optimistic, kind of very complacent reading of the British past that begins with the writing out of history of the English Revolution, 
right? So I think it's it's that 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 uh, you know the, of the of the 17th century that is. So it's that kind of um, um, uh, acute uh, sensitivity to pre-industrial traditions as well. I think. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I don't think there's a simple answer. So I, that. Yeah, thank you. I think that, that's what, how I'd start to to sort of think about it. Uh, how much time? Uh, this is I, I don't mean to. I mean I think it's the criticisms are are interesting, and I I, I don't mean to pile yet another. But Thompson didn't take into consideration the following. <laughs> um, but if you think about this time from the London Corresponding Society till almost till P the Peterloo Massacre, uh, this is a time when uh, Britain is at war. It's at a, in a major war, in a war that demands that the state extract from its population um, much more than in peacetime, um, more than most other uh, countries even at that time have to. And yet, one doesn't feel like when you're reading the, um, the making of the English working class that you're reading about a country at, at, at war. And I wonder about this. I mean, obviously, this criticism has been made by Linda Colley um, to address the question of whether or not the vast majority of workers that one might look at weren't, in fact, patriotic and conservative. And, and that's something that neither of you addressed, and I'd, I'd like to, to raise it. But I'd also like to raise the question of whether or not this, the Thompsonian way of doing working class history had a kind of tendency to ignore the great impact that war has actually had on um, making and unmaking of classes in the modern era. Um, well, I sort of respectfully disagree, actually. Um, I don't think war is absent from the making. I think, you know, Thompson's whole uh, narrative of the English Jacobinism and the, the, uh, the, his uh, uh, discussion of the uh, period between 1799 and uh, Peterloo is completely structured around the coercive response of the state in the name of its security needs and in the name of patriotism during a period during a period of war against France. I mean, that seems to me to be. I mean, it's not. Um, uh, you know, the war as such is not. You know, kind of uh, explicated in uh, uh, enormous detail in the book, but there's a lot of impingement, you know, in the particulars as well as in that general um, um, determination, you know, of, uh, of um, the consequences of um, uh, uh, a state um, uh, acting coercively in a time of war in the name of security to uh, suppress dissent. So I, I, I think that isn't one of the lacunae that I would um, uh, prioritize, at least, in, in, uh, in, um, in um, thinking about you know, what, what the book doesn't do. I mean, I don't know whether um, Jim ag agrees with that or not, as somebody who knows this period better than, uh, than I do. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> well, to say, to say that, I, 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 <laughs> you know, the, 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 in a way, both you know, both issues. You, you could come at it different ways. I mean, I think it is a book definitely written in the context of. I mean, Peter Lou, after all, is a reference to Waterloo, right. and um, of course, Thompson is quite interested, for instance, in the loyalist. Oh, sorry, in the loyalist mob and the point at which uh, you can't actually get you know, uh, large numbers for uh, pain burnings and this kind of stuff. On the other, and of course, he's, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on the mutinies at the Nore and the Spithead. Of course, mm -hmm. in, in Thompson's narrative, uh, he's interested in the Jacobin influence or what is, you know, perceives as the Jacobin influence in the Navy. 
Um, on the other hand, the question of loyalism, uh, you know, is an, an important one. And, and uh, I, I think there's been a lot of work on that post, you know, Thompson. I'll point out the word patriot is not a word that would be used like that because the word patriot actually had a kind of left leaning sort of in influence. In fact, uh, government supporters, that's why they talked about loyal loyalists and not patriots. And a lot of that actually even goes back to the American, you know, re re revolution. But, um, and, and of course, also, you, you also have to remember that while, while there is this kind of um, tax being and burden being put on the nation. And Th Thompson could have talked about this in, in, in different ways. I mean, he, he does talk about um, volunteer corps and, of course, very much disagrees with Colley on how to, how to kind of read the nation or, uh, uh, you know, volunteerism. Um, you know, Britain is at war, but in fact, I would say the governments, th you know, that are acting in this kind of repressive way, in some ways are very leery of actually, I mean, until you get to the Peninsula Wars, of actually mobilizing large numbers of working people into an army. I mean, there's a navy, but if you think about it, one of the reasons the war is a standoff uh, is that uh, Britain can't really match, you know, the land, you know, the armies of Napoleon, and Napoleon can't actually do any, you know, actually break through the navy. And once you actually get, you know, to Trafalgar and, and those losses, you know, things change. But I mean. Britain does not have a large army, uh, except for in the Caribbean. I mean, where it, it, I mean, in, in, in the early part of the war, it, you know, it's the Caribbean contest. Yeah. Um, a question for Steve. Um, um, I want to. I hear. I heard you throwing down the gauntlet, and I want to. I'm not quite sure where it landed. So, um, I heard you after a lot of reverence for Thompson. I heard you say that. Um, the story of class formation presented in his book is something we just need to give up. That once you bring in the empire, um, once you bring in all the workers that he left out, the kind of linear teleological story of class formation that he wrote cannot be written. Uh, I heard you say that um, uh, Thompson's remarkable for helping us understand the inventive, creative ways in which workers anywhere will seek justice, redress, um, advantage, dignity, and that he remains relevant for that reason. Uh, but that the dominant story that, that the, the story that structures his book is one that can no longer be um, sustained, and we have to give it up. Uh, so I'm sharpening things deliberately, but I think there's a utility in sharpening. And uh, maybe these are some of the answers to class, Jeff, that you were going to offer as well in your final comments. So I would invite you to comment as well. But I. I think it's important to get this out on the table and confront this issue uh, directly that at the end of the day, the central analytic that structures his book is one that we no longer accept as valid for telling this, for writing the history at this moment in time. Well, I would consider getting into it, but um, I'm worried about not getting dinner at the end of this. <laughs> but if you can assure me of that, um, look, I, my, my point is not that class formation as a theoretical construct and a uh, sort of analytical pursuit uh, by any means needs to be thrown out. It just seems to me that what you look, what strikes me about the making of the English working class in view of what we have learned over the past five decades is that his, uh, his notion of the working class and what class formation may entail and what it may encompass was too narrow. And it seems to me, for example, uh, l let me just sort of reflect on this in an American context. Um, one of the things uh, uh, that has often been talked about uh, regarding American exceptionalism is that the United States um, industrialized with an enfranchised working class. This is organized around the uh, notion of the extension of the franchise you know, to all adult men, uh, white men, um, uh, in the uh, early parts of the 19th century, Jacksonian democracy, or uh, however you want to call it. Um, but in point of fact, I mean, that's only the case if you think about the working class in a very, very narrow way. Um, that, and if you recognize that, in fact, um, you know, American economic growth was driven 
uh, by the connection between the cotton economy in the South and the textile industry of the North, both of which had working classes that were all utterly excluded, uh, not simply from the franchise, but from any standing in civil and political society. Now, do we simply, as I think we have done in the past, and I think this is one of the things that the artisan to worker model um, sort of uh, uh, conduces, is we just overlook them and also overlook rural people. Uh, as important uh, elements of the working class? Or do we try to reconfigure our understanding about what class making is about um, so that uh, the, the sort of net and the canvas is, is uh, much broader and appropriately so? And so I guess my feeling about this is that now when you come to the making of the English working class, having read uh, a literature which, especially in the past decade or so, has been very much concerned with empire, with the, uh, with the British Empire, but empire more generally, and with the relationship between sort of the col colonies and the center, that uh, doesn't this require a rethinking of what we mean by class and what we mean by state and what we mean, uh, you know, Thompson, I, it seems to me, and I think the war question is a good one, and it seems to me, in some ways, war is sort of the backdrop, but it's not, you know, war is taking place within England, and I think he makes that very clear. You know, he, he wants us to understand this as a, an insurrectionary set of moments, and with true struggle in, the, in violent and militarized terms. But I think the wider wars and the relationship of various sections of the working class, including maritime workers, to this, is not really explored. And it seems to me that some of the work, uh, again, that's being done in the American context, but I'm sure is being done elsewhere, that is focusing on um, uh, common laborers, uh, uns what we call unskilled workers, uh, male and female, uh, who populate um, the economy in great numbers, move all over the place, or are ethnically and racially diverse. Uh, seems to be me to be um, demanding uh, attention uh, and not dismantling or rejecting the idea of class as a useful way of thinking about this, but in fact trying to rethink and reconceptualize what we mean so that it um, will be more useful and sensible to me. I, I think a lot about the war issue because the United States is involved in all sorts of wars. Uh, in the 19th century, where we're only beginning to learn more about the social composition of people who went off, whether in the regular army, which has been extremely understudied, uh, which plays a, a significant role all over the place, but especially in the trans-Mississippi West um, in the second half of the 19th century, but also the volunteers, and also these filibustering missions that, you know, we don't hear much about, but they're extremely important in connecting sort of the projection of American power and also the um, accumulation uh, of people, many of whom are uh, from working populations in cities uh, who go off and engage in them. And you know, the political uh, issues, I think, are really important. Uh, Ari, uh, um, you don't get to speak. Um, th hold it until, and, and come in on the, I want to get another question, and then use the opportunity to respond. Ari, is there, is the mic close? I have a history of historiography question, and I, I <laughs> and uh, I, I feel it's, it's a bit of a distraction, and actually, maybe that's also at the core of my question. One thing that I that struck me is the space that Thompson gives to religion, and um, it's something that hasn't come up in our conversation well explicitly. I mean, the, you touched on it, so it struck me that religion is not simply a residual category for him, um, mainly because it's culture and anything that's culture is a resource. Um, but it's, it's more than that. It is really the tone and the space um, that he gives to culture, uh, to religion. And I was wondering about well, the reception of that part um, and if in the, in the impact that the work had, if that was, if that, if that was dropped. Um, at some point, um, yeah. Um, no, 
I think it was it, it, that was extremely enabling. And in fact, there's a whole um, British um, historiography of the of um, the sociology of religion, particularly nonconformity, that certainly didn't require Thompson to get started because I mean it's a very elaborate kind of tradition of work. But it, it but Thompson's uh, Thompson's uh, book um, and more general presence had. Had the effect of moving it in. Uh, but, I mean, beyond beyond England, actually. I mean, I can see that. But for yeah. France, I, I mean, I know Berenson and and no, uh, but, I, but 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 Bill Sewell doesn't ever bring it up. And so yeah, no, that's but, that's that's fair enough. Sorry, I I, I I was I was thinking in terms of the British coordinates. Um, and so I mean, the the first person who, who I th think of in that respect is Jim Belkovich, You know, who published who produced this. Um, and who, I can't remember when he went to Warwick. Did he go to Warwick when Thompson was there? He did yeah. Uh, you know, on popular religion in, uh, in Lincolnshire, and uh, which was notable for its willingness to treat not just or organized religion, but folk religion as well. So in those ways, I think Thompson, Thompson was extraordinarily um, um, enabling. Um, more generally, I mean, I don't think uh, the Tom I don't think the the uh, the North American Thompsonians, in their work on you know the respective national histori historiographies where they um, situated themselves, took that particular incitement. I can't think. I mean, I, I may, maybe I'm not thinking of of uh, cases, but I mean, I think I think that was not taken up more broadly. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, if you consider Thompson's impact in other parts of the world, like South Asia, then I think uh, the story will be different again. You know, in terms of what uh, the the uh, subalternists took from <coughs> readings of Thompson, or have taken. Right? Uh, the only other thing I was going to add to this very eloquent response, right, which I uh, uh, thoroughly agree with, is that. Um, it's not, it's not so much the wrongness of Thompson's account as its insufficiencies and, and the way, you know, and I began by saying always historicize. And that means historicizing not only, not just the work, you know, the, the work of history, but also the histories that it, that it, um, that it, uh, that it constructed, that it produced. Because, um, uh, you know, the working class of history um, in Thompson's telling, actually needs to be, you know, kind of located in a very uh, finite and determinate period of world history, um, and uh, it was preceded by um, the uh, the mass proletariat of plantation slavery, but also the other, you know, the other, you know, the actually the largest category of workers in Thompson's England uh, were servants. Actually, which we haven't mentioned yet, but which Carolyn Steedman's work again is, is has been fabulous in kind of uh, calling our attention to. And so, if you kind of take those two huge facts of plantation, you know, plantation slavery and indentured labor in the in the transatlantic world, and uh, you know the uh, the working class of servitude and ser domestic service in uh, side England itself. That massively relativizes, you know, the story that Thompson tells. So that, that, that doesn't disqualify, uh, you know, uh, uh, Thompson's history, but it, uh, it you know, it, it call, calls on us to uh, situate it uh, far more uh, carefully in a in a in a in a larger larger set of histories. I think this also might, could get us back to the actual definition of class, which is to say, if you look at Thompson's definition of class and what he thought of, I mean, that Thompson's very, uh, definition of class very much involves, uh, you know, what Marx would call class for itself. That is, say, people who are consciously expressing their sort of classness, however we kind of interpret that. And so I think that what happens in the book is, uh, a group like, uh, a hugely important group, as Jeff says, like servants don't fit the story because uh, they don't fit the story because, you know, they're not, 
you know, they're not manifestos of maid serf. I mean, I'm not saying there's another story to be told there, but it doesn't fit the kind of definition of, uh, of class I think that we get uh, in the preface, which is a very kind of maximalist definition uh, of class. I mean, it requires certain things going on uh, that uh, would be more difficult to uh, you know, to produce uh, out of the material he has. As for the artisans, I think it's important to remember that he's also working against, I mean, this goes back to Joel's question, he's working against, of course, a tradition, a Marxist tradition that is seeing the working class very much as a proletariat and a proletariat defined as factory workers who, of course, are a very small section of the British working class at, at this period. And I think that's actually why the chapter you read, we read on exploitation becomes very important. Because I think what Thompson would like to argue, or does argue, is that what connects these people is a kind of concept and experience of exploitation, whether that is you know, field laborers, or whether that's factory workers, or you know, sort of degraded you know, artisans. But I do take your point about a certain romanticization of um, the artisan, I think that's also got to do, it could take us other places. It could take us to places about, you know, concepts of work, concepts of skill, uh, and Thompson's own interest in William Morris and kind of the way in which, you know, there's a certain kind of privileging in that, those kind of anti-industrial romantic uh, writers about, uh, you know, a kind of artisanal sort of production that makes uh, labor not a kind of alienated, I mean, this also goes back to the you know, 44 manuscripts, you know, the, a, a less alienated sort of, uh, you know, experience, but something that's actually f fulfilling in the actual act of work. Um, actually, this, this uh, works well because I was thinking very much um, along these lines of wanting to push this question of how scholars today, if they're conceiving of working on issues of class could think about how to go about defining a working class, particularly if um, in light of, of these various um, waves of, of, of historiography, that class is now conceived of so very broadly in, su in such a, a varied and, and fractured way. Um, and I was particularly interested um, in, uh, in understanding, um, uh, Steve Hahn, how you might think about this, because I noticed that your approach to class is quite strikingly different from the more narrow definition that um, E.B. Thompson seems to give, requiring a certain political self-consciousness and co collective action. Um, at least in your comments, you suggest that we should perhaps reconceive of class as something that could be thrust upon one, inhabited a way of living and talking. So particularly if you would want to take such a broad conception of how class could be defined, then, um, then how would one go about deciding who would be in and who would be out? <laughs> we'll, give you two well, thanks a lot. <laughs> um, well, I, I think uh, what you caught is, is something that I've been thinking a lot about, and I do, I, I think Jim's point too, about a certain way of, I mean, Thompson was, was so interested in contesting uh, a mechanistic notion of class that could be uh, understood in objective ways, which is, as he puts it, cotton plus machines equal the working class. And that he was so interested in, in seeing class in its political manifestations and as a process of sort of political self-consciousness that happens. And it's, it seems to me that on the one hand that there are many moments where in many contexts where one can see that sort of thing happening. Um, but it also seems to me that precisely because of the um, this, the scale and the diversity of, of, of classness uh, as people kind of inhabit it or experience it, and the difficulty of articulating it uh, in ways that Thompson wants to see us do. I mean, what I would say is that I think we need, you know, in the American context, the obvious alternatives to class have always been race and ethnicity. 
And I, I have to confess that in recent, in the past couple of decades, I've been disappointed to the extent that scholars have so clearly abandoned class as a useful way of thinking about uh, otherness and um, uh, self-definition and have seen so, have grabbed on so easily and comfortably to ideas about race and ethnicity as if it bears no, res no connection or resemblance to anything we might understand as class. Now in American society, in contemporary American politics, we understand, although middle class seems to be the you know, way we'll, we'd be willing to talk about it, but I do think that um, a, uh, an expansive sense of working people and how they populate um, territories um, as those territories come into being states, as the relationships between nation states and colonies or imperial boundaries get defined. It seems that it's a challenge to us to try to, just as it was a challenge, I think Jeff brought up really the interesting case of South Asian historiography that was initially very influenced by the social historical, I mean, if you look at, let's say, Depeche, Depeche Chakrabarti's work and his first book on um, jute workers in Bengal, which is clearly uh, influenced by Thompson's work, and then his sort of more culturalist moves and interrogating I mean, his, his work on provincializing Europe and others, that I think what's happened in the subaltern literature, uh, which is not only about workers but about peasants too, and arguing against the nationalist historiography in India, um, to try to take some of these ideas and talk about um, what I think could reasonably co be called a, a process of class making in ways that are gestured at in this book. One of the things I really like about the Luddism chapter is that actually many of the themes of this book come together. It is about exploitation. It's about, um, he, he, he argues vehemently against a representation of Luddites as backward looking people. He sees Luddism as part of a process of change, as a transitional moment. He emphasizes a political underground. And this is, a, this is an idea that is throughout this whole book that I don't think, certainly in the American context, has been picked up very well at all, but he was very sensitive uh, to this and to the uh, forms of working class organization um, that made this possible and the, the sort of insurrectionary aspects of what's going on. And so to that extent, although we watched Thompson's work march back into the 18th century over time where he does feel very comfortable, um, as if that's really what he's, you know, that, that's what he's trying to grab, where in fact I think a lot of this book is looking ahead to chartism um, where, you know, I, I mean in some ways that would be where it appropriately ended and for his own reasons he decided not, you know, to end it there. So I, I, I kind of see this interesting mix in the book and ways of thinking about the um, laboring populations in relationship to class that he doesn't really fully develop or in fact pay as much attention to as they deserve, but a lot of the pieces of the picture, you know, I think are, 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 are really, are still very, very vital for us. Um, we have two questions left, uh, Michael, Beth, and Matt, and I'm going to ask you to ask your <coughs> questions together and then to give each, each of you a chance to respond. And Jeff, I don't know if you've had a chance yet to give us your answers from <laughs> the questions you raised about class, but if you want to weigh in with yeah, right. that in some form, I do that in response to the questions that were asked. Um, Michael. Well, I don't actually have a, a question. It's sort of a, a comment. All along I've been, I've been asking, and I'm sorry, I guess I would just ask you to comment on my comment. Um, um, I, I've been asking myself, what's still alive in his analysis? And, and um, despite these attenuations, um, you mentioned um, Occupy Wall Street. I'm trying to think, you know, if he were here, what would he be wanting uh, us to still be taking from his work? What would we be hoping that this work could still be giving to us? And um, one of the things that really struck me in working on Thompson was um, that he w there was this constant dialectic between what he was studying as a historian looking at the past and his 
an experience as an activist in the present. So the making of the English working class, he's drawing very much from his experience with the New Left Clubs and CND. And then he comes back again 20 years later with END and the whole anti-nuclear movement. And what really strikes me is this book becomes um, like a how-to manual, in a sense. Study what they did back then. And partly, I think, that was a projection back onto them of images and hopes that he had for the left in the, in the 50s and 60s. Study what they bid, did back then, then withdraw from that a general template. How do uh, people find each other across boundaries, defining a new sense of us that will allow them to engage in collective, purposive agency in new ways. When you see the book as trying to create this kind of template, all these other, the limitations and attenuations, you say, well, this is a case study. He's trying to create a general template. And he applied it in the struggle against militarism later on with the anti-nuclear movements. I think you could use this kind of analysis in looking at the Arab Spring. I think you could use it very much in looking at Occupy Wall Street. Um, and in a sense, I, what I find useful about it is, is this notion of a template for um, mobilization. I wish I could say this question is closely connected to Michael's, but it's not. Um, some of us have been reminiscing about what we read in graduate school in my generation uh, in the 70s, certainly read E.B. Thompson, uh, but we also read Charles Tilley. And I remember being inspired by both and also uh, being troubled by the, seemed to be the total incommensurability between the two approaches. And uh, Tilly, for example, did not consider religion to be an independent variable. And when he was talking about the rebels in the Vendée and they see the Virgin Mary appear to them, uh, he can't do anything with this. It doesn't, it, it doesn't, it doesn't fit his models. Um, and it seems to me that uh, Thompson was not the only influence, but one important one uh, in the growing divorce between history and sociology, uh, which in many ways was uh, epitomized by what you might call uh, Bill Sewell's Princeton turn, uh, a Tilly student who essentially rejected sociology for a different kind of social history informed by cultural anthropology and other things. And in many ways, this divorce has only increased. And so my question, which surely can't be answered in a few minutes, um, is whether reflecting on this history and reflecting on some of the ways in which we think uh, Thompson's contribution could be added to or modified, is there some way in which we can close that gap and make use of what some of the social sciences have to offer? Um, and I'm addressing this question to Jeff in particular because um, your work on uh, methodology in the human sciences is often cited by um, historical sociologists who don't read much history. Um, and I'll just add in closing, it, it struck me that this question hasn't come up here in part, I think, because the absence of sociology, sociological models, social science method, uh, seems completely unproblematic. Uh, why would we raise a question about it? Uh, well, that's a, a huge question, you know, and, uh, and you could argue that Sewell actually has spent the last 20 years more, actually. I think the, 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 uh, his inhabiting of a post gertzian kind of understanding of, of uh, the culture concept was rel relatively brief because, you know, for the last 25 years, he's been regrounding himself in a, in a, in a, so, you know, in a, in a, in a historical so sociology, I, I think. You know, if you take that, I, I always forget what it's, it's called Logics of History, isn't it, the volume? Well, that's, uh, you know, that the ground, uh, the conceptual, intellectual ground of that book is is very much sociology it seems to me yeah no but he's really yeah but whatever right um, I mean it's obviously obviously you know Bill Bill's 
um, sort of uh, intellectual formation is obviously extremely complex, but um, it seems to me his chosen ground has become social theory in a, in a, in a disciplinary um, set of ways, which isn't to disagree with, with your observation about the um, indifference of uh, historians and sociologists to each other. I'm, I'm surprised to hear that actually my work is cited by s historical sociologists other than, say, my friends in Michigan. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> Peggy Summers and George Steinmetz and, and, uh, and, you know, Bill to some extent. I mean, there's a Michigan-Chicago kind of nexus in those ways. Uh, and I, and I think that's a consequence of, of uh, you know, what we call the cultural turn. You know, and sociologists have got their own version of culture, but it does, it's not in conversation with, very frequently, with what historians have been, have, have been doing. And I, I agree that's interesting, whether, I'm not sure how much I care about it anymore, you know? Given the kinds of things that so sociologists seem, you know, they're not interested in what I'm doing, for instance. So why should I continue to make the effort? You know. <laughs> I mean, it's a ser it is a serious, you know, I'm making a joke, but it is a, it is a serious question, and I'm, 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 I'm not sure how to, how to um, uh, you know, respond briefly. Um, and then, um, yeah, well, how can we use, uh, t I actually don't find uh, Thompson's understanding of class narrow, actually. I think it's, I think it's extremely capacious and very extremely sophisticated, you know, in terms of, you know, the quote, I'll just read this quotation that I didn't read out, seems to me to be really good. It's from, you know, a, a subsequent essay, I think, rather than uh, the, the making. Class eventuates as men and women live their productive relations and as they experience their determinate situations within the ensemble of the social relations. Sort of very Althusserian term for Thompson. <laughs> with their inherited culture and expectations, and as they handle these experiences in cultural ways, so that in the end, no model can give us what ought to be the true class formation for a certain stage of process. No actual class formation in history is any truer or more real than any other, and class defines itself as, in fact, it eventuates. Now that asks us actually to be really good and careful historians. And Thompson, in his 18th century work, I think, you know, provided really fabulous examples of how you do that in an empirical, analytical mode. You know, and Thompson always described himself as a Marxist in the empirical mode in those ways. So um, I think that, uh, that uh, it's really important to remember that, that you know, Thompson was consciously uh, writing an epic account so that class is a master concept and, a, and, a, and an organizing concept in, in ways that are defined by those rhetorical uh, exigencies. Right? And so when he's writing about the 18th century in that empirical analytical mode, I mean, he's a very different uh, sort of historian with very different kinds of attentiveness than in, even in those chapters on exploitation and the Luddites and so on in the, in the making. Um, and I'm not sure, you see, I, I'm not sure how, I'm not sure that it's a m very good manual in those ways. Because um, the, the key question for me is the one that I mentioned in that whole uh, list of questions, and that's about continuity. How do you create continuity? How do you create, how do you create continuity out of explosions of uh, oppositional activity that can have momentary effectiveness but don't translate into uh, uh, sort of or an organized presence with political efficacy over time. And for Thompson, as I, as I said, that, that was not a prob problem because his understanding of class was one that, uh, that accumulated that kind of continuity because it was that grand scale concept of a certain way. And see, I don't think that's very helpful for us. Um. 
Well, I, I don't really have m much to add to that. Uh, but just a couple of things. I mean, you know, it does. I have to confess. I mean, I've always had a um, a real interest in in both historical sociology and in uh, historically oriented political science. I mean, I think about books that have been very, very uh, fundamental to my thinking and um, and have helped me, you know, I, I, it's my own structuralist tendencies, but um, have helped me sort of um, uh, kind of have a sort of a, a map of things. And, um, and so in some ways my attraction to Thompson's a little odd. Um, and uh, I, I, I think, uh, you know, I, 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 Michael's uh, points are, I think, uh, good and powerful ones. I, I, you know, Thompson gave an interview to Radical History Review, um, which uh, was probably in the late 70s, I don't know. Um, and he was um, talking about um, his work in relationship to what he saw as a political project. And that project was the, you know, how to imagine a socialist society. And he talked a lot about the networks and institutions. Um, and then when I think about the nuclear disarmament activities and his writing, I, I never heard him speak on that. But, um, you know, he was very attentive to language and the language of militarism and exterminism. I think that was one of the concepts he had. It seems to me that that, you know, is if he, perhaps if he were here to talk about, you know, what what there is in this book here, it's it's kind of reservoirs of ideas and, and uh, linguistic constructs as, as um, uh, uh, to draw on in um, uh, challenging capitalism. And um, that I don't think he would have felt that they're not to be reconfigured, they are, but I, I think he was interested in the way in which people were able to do that. And uh, the, the many resources that they had, I think that's one of the things that's really striking about the book, the source material that he draws from and his sense. I mean, that's one of the things I found going back to it this time is that his sense of where things were happening, even if he didn't really have the documentation, I thought it was, it was absolutely remarkable, but his kind of sense of these um, uh, uh, political discourses, this, this sort of underground activities, how people got together, what they might have talked about, and his ways of making a persuasive case by sort of cobbling together, you know, small bits of, of, uh, of evidence. And, uh, you know, for, for the early 1960s, I mean, that was just a stunning um, accomplishment. And I think that is something that, going back to that book, um, is 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 very very striking. Yeah. Very briefly, yeah. yeah um, I, I don't want to be misunderstood in my, you know, satirical <laughs> remarks about about historical sociologists because I I you know I read so social theory and re I read historical sociology and other kinds of sociology all the time, right? But I you know I went to the the Social Science History Association. Again, for the you know, I've been several times over over my life, once in the 1980s and once in the early 1990s, and now again. And if the first time the session I was on a session which was basically about the sociology of collective action, it was a bunch of chock students, historians and sociologists. So that was one moment. By the early 90s, there was a big plenary in Chicago on culture, and it was Bill Sewell, um, me, and uh, Nancy Fraser. And Jim Cronin, as a you know a, a recalcitrant, recalcitrant Tillyish social historian, as as the commentator. But this time I went back, and there were no historians there. I mean, there were some demographers, you know, who all you know, and some urban historians, and they've always been in their own space to a great extent. Uh, but otherwise, it was all sociologists, and then one or two people like me, and there was no conversation going on <laughs> whatsoever. The only other thing, the final thing that I say in terms of my answers uh, to those questions about, you know, how, how, we un how, how, how are we to understand the problem of creating continuities now, right? 
But it seems to me that that what, that we have to be structuralist about this. I mean, we, we it seems to me that no understanding of the contemporary manifestations of um, of, uh, of of you know social conflict, or you might even call it class conflict, is it makes sense without trying to figure out the uh, regularities in the distribution of social inequality in structured structured ways that no, you know that we have to try and understand class formation in this particular period of uh, capitalist history and that, and so that's you know and, and 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 then we can start talking about these you know how a, a particular political capacities might be created and we can start thinking about how they might be um, uh, bound into the sort of organized continuities that will only ever create efficacy in politics, right? So that's that's the, that's the challenge of the Occupy um, phenomenon. Excellent. Okay, um, we've gone longer, and I'm going to forego um, my normal commentary, except to quote from our two speakers here. I want to thank them for. Um, uh, brilliant evocations, reviews, critiques of Thompson's work. I think um, we heard today both a tremendous appreciation for the strength and seminal character of this work and also um, the ongoing problems that it raises that we have not really solved. I don't, uh, the uh, many eloquent words were said today um, and I'm focusing on something Jeff said near the end that part of our problem is to understand explosions of activity that don't have political efficacy over time. Uh, and I hear in that uh, that we have a problem with our theory of class formation that Thompson ultimately ran up against, that our dissatisfaction with Thompson has something to do with, that is bound up with the decline of labor history. And I would say we haven't really found our way to a new theory of class formation uh, that helps us navigate our through the world. We have certainly a much broader sense of who constitutes working people and how inequalities are manifested in social life. But if we really think about bringing together domestic workers, slaves, and um, British workers, artisans, together in a single story of class formation, I actually don't think we figured out how to do that. And it means that we're... Uh, those of us who have thought a lot about this and, and want to make some progress on it, we're still in a way blocked. And um, I would like to look forward to a day when we might um, get over that. And I don't think structuralism fully solves the problem. Um, it's a start. Yes, 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 I agree. Uh, and then the uh, phrase from Steve that will stick with me for a long time, um, how Thompson opens up uh, doors of understanding and uh, exploration. And how many books, about how many books can you say that every time you go back to them, uh, new doors of understanding and exploration open up. And uh, for those of you who haven't looked at Thompson, I would invite you to do that. It doesn't have to be 832 pages. It can be <laughs> the preface. It can be um, a chapter here and there. You've heard expressions about those chapters that are the favorites of those who've read him a lot. Uh, so I think it's appropriate to conclude um, with an invitation to do just that. Uh, and I thank the two of you for accepting our invitation uh, to come here and to talk with us um, about an extraordinary work of history, its place in history, its lessons for today, and how we think about moving forward, uh, both in a methodological sense and for those of us who care about this in, uh, in politics as well. So please join me in thanking our two guests for a wonderful seminar.